A large portion of the Jewish nation has returned to its homeland, but the heart, soul, and mind of much of the Jewish nation are still in exile mode. This state of affairs must and will inevitably change. This is Torah Nation TV from Jerusalem, and we are speaking with the head of Machon Shiloh, Rabbi David Bar Chaim. Shalom, Rabbi Bar Chaim. Shalom. A Jew who studied in a high-level yeshiva for several years once told me that the really bright students did not remain in the yeshiva for many years due to their frustration with the prevailing lack of intellectual honesty and depth. Does the rabbi have any comments? I can most uh, certainly identify with uh, this person's comments. I did feel very much the same thing with regards to the yeshivot in which I did learn. And I think this is a fair and objective comment and description of the almost all of the yeshiva world. I once uh, mentioned in another interview that there is a very strange dichotomy in the yeshiva world in the uh, methodology of study. In the first years of yeshiva students' studies, he is trained to study Gemara, Talmud, Bavli, Be'iyun, that is to say in depth, and he is trained to think and to ask uh, serious questions and not to accept uh, simplistic or unsatisfactory answers, etc. I remember, for example, when I was uh, 17 years old and I was studying in a, a certain yeshiva here in Yerushalayim, uh, the, one of the first things our, our Ram, our teacher, said at the beginning of the year was that when you study Gemara, you have to be an apikoros, which of course sounds a rather, rather a strange thing to say, but he went on to explain that what I mean is that if Abaye says something in the Gemara and you don't understand wh why he said it or why this is so, then you don't just accept it, you have to ask and you have to not go on until you understand. You can't just accept something because it's written there, you have to know why it is so. And this, I believe, is very true and very correct. And this is how yeshiva students are trained to think for the first few years, but when they later uh, usually marry and they go into what's called a kolel and they begin to study uh, more halachically uh, focused studies. All of a sudden there's a strange metamorphosis whereby the student is essentially told right now you need to stop thinking and asking all those good questions that you asked before because now we're studying what the halacha is, what we a posek, what the psak halacha is, how it should be, and this is it can only be in this way. This is how it must be, and uh, and that's it. And don't ask any questions. This is the mindset of almost every single kolel or any other uh, um, Torah rabbinic uh, institution or academy on earth, which trains uh, supposedly trains rabbis in Talmudic Chachamim. Unfortunately. What they are training very often are simply parrots who repeat a, a certain position or a certain opinion. Sometimes they know why that opinion is so and why, and why it was stated in this fashion and other times they don't even know that. They just know this is the bottom line and they know that they're not, they're not allowed to think outside of that box. This is the underlying message. Sometimes it's an overt message and other times it's uh, subliminal, but the message is certainly there. This, in general, results in uh, people who are supposed to be Tamadei Chachamim, but very often, for the most part, are not, in the sense that they are not uh, trained in critical Torah thinking. They are not uh, capable or certainly unwilling to express an opinion, and they're unwilling very often even to think a matter through uh, under their own steam. And they rely only on what uh, is accepted or what a certain uh, Rav says, and they are not willing to actually think things through and ask the, the, the difficult questions and perhaps come up with a different uh, position, a different approach. And this, despite the fact that over time, we have, uh, we have been blessed with the uh, possibility of 
uh, seeing manuscripts and many works that were hidden from the view of many of the Torah scholars of past centuries, uh, works that uh, were somehow lost or almost lost and were miraculously found and published uh, in more recent times and down to the present day, every day almost something new is published which can shed new light on different aspects of the Torah. And the suggestion that we should ignore all of, all of this bounty, this Torah bounty that Hashem has placed before us, such a suggestion is, to put it mildly, absurd. This is all very similar to the reality that existed with regards to astronomy in the 15th and 16th centuries. Until that time, the Ptolemaic model, geocentric model, in which the solar system uh, had its, at its center the Earth and the Sun revolved around uh, the Earth. This system was accepted for, for the longest time by many, many highly intelligent and, uh, and successful uh, astronomers and scientists, including, for example, the Rambam. And yet, of course, it was very wrong, and there were many difficulties with this system, and eventually other suggestions came to the fore, particularly the suggestions of the theories and explanations of Nicolaus Copernicus and uh, later proved and demonstrated by people such as Johannes Kepler and Galileo Galilei, etc., by observation through the teles through telescope, etc. And, and thus a new age came about, a new view of the solar system of the world was possible, a much more correct and, and and uh, real and uh, intellectually honest understanding of the created universe. Imagine a world in which all of this knowledge and all of these, uh, all of this thinking and theorizing and uh, ob ob observation was ignored and was uh, suppressed because it contradicted the ancient Ptolemaic model, the geocentric model, and w which was now replaced by the by these new theories and new ideas and new observations, which was now replaced with the heliocentric, the sun-centered model. Imagine where we would be today if we, the human race, still believed that the uh, sun revolved around the earth and not vice versa. Almost the same thing can be said of the Torah world today in many respects. Many aspects of the Torah are fossilized and have been unable to develop and uh, we have been prevented, or the standard thinking in much of the Torah world prevents the uh, attainment of greater understanding and more correct understanding and greater insights and more, a more precise knowledge of the Torah in many of its aspects because of this fear of contradicting earlier opinions, earlier authorities, etc. This contradiction between reason and uh, human intelligence and the, and the struggle and the striving for excellence and, uh, and beauty and wisdom is unfortunately essentially squashed by the standard model of Torah study in the, in the world today. And this is a, a very, very major tragedy, which is, it's almost impossible to exaggerate the enormity of this tragedy. This is one of a number of major problems and deficiencies in the yeshiva world as it exists today. Is the rabbi implying that there are other problems and issues which need to be addressed in the yeshiva world? Yes, that's precisely what I am suggesting. I refer, for example, to the question of developing young minds trained in Torah who are also capable of critical thought. The faculty of critical thought and reasoning is essential to the creation of a true Tamit Chachamim. The difference between a person who has studied many texts and a person who has studied those same texts but has the ability to think critically and, and uh, analyze different opinions objectively cannot be overstated. It is, in fact, in my view, a crime, no less than a crime, what, what happens uh, very often in many, many yeshivot, probably in almost all yeshivot, to be honest, 
namely the fact that many young students, often 18, 19 years old, begin their studies in these yeshivot. Uh, young people who are blessed with uh, very sharp minds and have uh, showed very great promise, intellectual and spiritual abilities. And unfortunately, these people are often, these young men, and, and in Women's institutions of Torah learning, the same is also done, I think, to young women. I have no doubt this is the same, the same uh, mechanism is in play. These young people's minds are essentially uh, forced to deny that which they understand, that which they are capable of understanding. These young people are trained not to think, not how to think, but rather how not to think. They are taught that they must not question and analyze and think critically, but they must accept what is often presented to them as as da'at Torah or da'at Torah or whatever opinion or view it is that that particular institution wishes to to uh, to push, to sell, to uh, promote. You choose the uh, the verb of your choice. And uh, this again is is not how. Torah should be studied. This is not how human beings should should be allowed, or rather forced, to develop. Young uh, people with great intellectual uh, powers and abilities and, and spiritual ambitions and aspirations should be encouraged to study different opinions and different views and uh, delve d- deeply into these differences of opinion and to think critically and to ask good and difficult questions and expect and demand good and serious intellectually honest answers and all of this unfortunately is usually not the case it's very, in fact i would say uh, in a very very rare occurrence to find a place or a teacher who who acts and, and behaves in such a manner and the result is that the minds of these young people are essentially shut down so rather than developing the tremendous potential which exists within these young people's minds and souls they are turned into some kind of automaton or some kind of robot who follows orders who thinks and is capable of thinking only in a very very specific way and who cannot uh, after a time after a certain period of time being exposed to this this kind of regimen that person's mind is no longer capable of thinking clearly, understanding rational, cogent arguments because they've been turned into some kind of some kind of uh, follower or or even some would say some, some kind of a zombie and again this is a, a tragedy and I would say even a crime this is taking the God-given faculty of intellectual thought and reason and understanding the uh, gift that Hashem has granted us and uh, throwing it away, wasting it and uh, and crushing it underfoot and what greater tragedy and crime could there be than that? So why is it that the more gifted students often leave the yeshiva world? The reason very often the, the more gifted and uh, more serious students become very frustrated and often leave or at least um, withdraw from the, the mainstream of the yeshiva world and find their own very special niche but essentially uh, are no longer part of that yeshiva world. They quickly understand and perceive that uh, most of the heads of the yeshivot, the Rashi yeshivot, uh, most of them at least, if not the vast majority, are not really searching for the, the brilliant students with the tremendous potential, uh, the, the gifted individuals who ask the tough questions. What they're looking for are people who will accept and uh, tow a certain party line, people who will uh, continue to parrot what they've been taught in the yeshiva world when they leave that yeshiva world, when they go and teach in another school or another yeshiva, people who will be part of, of their entourage of followers and hangers-on uh, rather than people dedicated to uh, understanding Hashem's word and the, the plan of, of Hashem for the world 
as we find it in the Torah, and delving into all that in an intellectually honest, objective, and, and uh, exciting manner. Rather, people are taught, and the, the, the teaching staff and the heads of the yeshivoth often uh, make such people, the, the, the people with the good questions and the people who won't accept simplistic uh, answers, they make such people feel uncomfortable and uh, unwanted and uh, problematic, as it were. When in fact, those, those people are not the problem. Those students, those very intelligent, perceptive uh, students with true spiritual and intellectual aspirations, they are, far from being the problem, they in fact are the solution to the Yeshiva world's problem. Thank you, Rabbi Bar Chaim. We would like to encourage our viewers to share these videos with friends and send in your responses. We would also like to suggest the following opportunity to our viewers. If you identify with Rabbi Bar Chaim's message and would like to sponsor or dedicate a video interview with the rabbi in honor or memory of a loved one, if you would like to obtain Birkon Nusach Eretz Yisrael or invite the rabbi for a speaking engagement, please email us at office at machonchilo.org.